Richard. Thank you for the introduction. Um, thank you for inviting me for this presentation. Um, I'm postdoc here. I'm working in the Galactic Archaeology Group, of, uh, which is led by Professor uh, Silvia Rossi. Thank you for having me here for these four years. Okay. And so I'll give you an overview from the field. And But uh, I know there are a lot of students here, so I have to start uh, in give a little bit of uh, introduction that is easier for everyone. So the first thing is, what is stellar overdenses? You're not get from this specific phrase that I'm going to give you, but during the presentation, you're going to better understand what is this stellar overdenses. But, but basically, stellar overdenses are when you look at some point in the galaxy or in the direction of the galactic halo or something, we identify uh, excess in stellar counts. Um, it can be uh, have some pattern that is like a kind of filament. Sometimes it is just like a kind of cloud that doesn't have any kind of structure that you can connect to anything in the galaxy. And when you um, expected the galaxy, if it was um, evolving alone in the universe, it was be smooth structure, uh, and it's not what you see. So. First, you're going to um, separate um, the stellar overdensity in two types. One that we call low latitude stellar overdensities that we can find more close to the galactic plane. So in this figure, you are seeing a map from this Pan stars survey. Uh, it don't, is not uh, our sky survey. So basically, here you're seeing the anti-center of the galaxy. And so here is the galactic center in this part, in that part that you cannot see here. So this black part is not observed, and this part is removed by the extinction of the galaxy. And what you're seeing here is three, three selection cuts. 
in three different colors, blue, green, and red. So the blue one that you can see barely here in this uh, region uh, are the stars that are more close, between 10 to 15 kiloparsec. And the green one that you can see here, some filaments here, another filament here, another filament structure here, and are between 15 to 20 kiloparsec. Uh, and just to people that don't know, um, kiloparsec is about 3.2 kilo light years. So just to give a, a point of view of the distance. And um, so, and you have the after 25 kiloparsecs um, some red structures here in the galactic halo. And we are focused on the first part, so to try and understand what is this low latitude. So here you can see that you have some structure that's all in the southern hemisphere, blue that you cannot barely see in the north hemisphere. In the north hemisphere, more far away, you can see this green structure here that you don't see in the south hemisphere. And you can see a more another filament about the same distance here that you can see kind of arch in another structure here. So this structure, it's one that you're going to be discussing here. This green one, it's monocerus over density. And this one in the south is monocerus over density too. Because there was a part in the south and a part in the, in the north hemisphere, galactic hemisphere. And you have two, the um, halostellar over densities. That's another part of the structures. And basically here you're seeing um, galactic coordinates. So here in the direction of the, uh, oh sorry, galactic longitude. And yes, so basically you're seeing direction of the galactic center. And here, um, oh sorry, at the center of the galaxy. And we, uh, basically you're seeing, um, this is our, our, our leader. And basically these clumps are clumps or over instance of this kind of type of stars. Oh, thank you. Amazing. <laughs> so um, we can see that you have um, some structures next to um, the galaxy between 25 kiloparsecs, so it's really far away in the galactic halo. But you have more and more distant stars structures between 19 to 100 kiloparsecs from the Way. So just imagine it, the galaxy has about 100 kiloparsecs. So you're seeing basically a structure that has more than the size of our galaxy here to the halo. So we have several stellar over densities, already know. And here I'm going to present some of them that we studied during these four years that I was here, and some um, bit, and with a discussion that you have in the literature to better understand these structures. And the main point here is to try and understand um, the nature of these structures and you uh, what you have to yet to study and understand this structure and what information it brings to us about the formation and evolution of our galaxy. So we're going to start to about, uh, talking about the low latitude stellar over densities. And so to the people that um, are here, this plot is really difficult to see at the first time, but I will try to explain. So this is the figure that shows us uh, the discovery of the monoceros over density in 2002 using data from SDSS. It was just at that epoch. I know that you all have all these data from Gaia, uh, Apogee, and uh, other several surveys, but in the epoch we have a basically photometric surveys. And so what you have here is the magnitude, the apparent magnitude of these stars, 15, 17. So basically giving us a notion of um, distance for these stars, for these structures. And basically here is a, a beam or a, a view of the galaxy. So you're get, imagine it my, my hand is the galaxy. Like imagine this is the galaxy here in this plane. And you're having a view of this. It's a cut. So this is a cut. So here basically next to the uh, between minus 25 above the galactic plane. So in this region. And that one is above the galactic plane. So this is above the galactic plane, so here it starts to get the galactic plane. So this is a view. So basically what she identified here, uh, Neuber identified a stellar structure in this region, in this region, that uh, it was a stellar over density. As you can see, there is much more stars in this region next to the galactic plane that you have in other regions, for example, here, and other regions more in these regions. And yes, we can see other stellar structures here. This is uh, the Sagittarius string, here part of the galactic halo, but our other stellar structures. But our focus in this one. So this structure was discovered at first. Uh, they didn't have too much data in that epoch. But um, later, um, Ibata has a lot of observations um, that are really photometric uh, 
deep photometric survey. And what he identified is the structure was this, uh, distributed over, over basically all the long galactic longitudes in the galaxy. So in his interpretation, this was a kind of structure that was surrounding the galaxy. It was a kind of ring around the galaxy. This was the first assumption. Uh, it was already to observe it from other um, works from Yanni and Rocha Pinto, uh, where they observed this distribution over more than 100 uh, degrees in the sky. But um, the discussion was, is this from our galaxy or this is, was uh, created? So the first works started to uh, try to discuss that it was uh, belonging to our galaxy if you included the warp and the flare. Basically, warp is um, a kind of middle inclination in the, you have the galactic plane, so the galactic plane is warped or in, have some inclination compared to the galactic plane. And the flare is basically when you have some liquid and you run this, make it move, like make circles, it's going to start to spread like that in the borders. So uh, his assumption using a galactic mo model was that if you include these um, counts, in the um, density distribution. And you see here the data is these black dots. Uh, the models can very well uh, describe these structures that you are seeing in specific positions. Here is just for one specific position. Later, uh, OK. Uh, so later here, seeing different distance for our um, I think the microphone is disconnected. No or not? No? OK. So for different distance, here you can see by the uh, mod distance modulus. But basically, what he identified, Martin, was that there is a structure that was called Kennedy's Major. And basically, uh, he identified an arch that was this southern watch that I told you that was monoceros in the south because we have a lot of different names during over the time because people are, look like to put the different names in things, and another ring that was monoceros in the North Hemisphere. And basically, to him, it was connected to this structure that was Canis Major. So if it was a, a stellar, uh, stellar um, structure that don't, was not belong to Milky Way, it was a, galac a galaxy that was uh, created by Milky Way, it should have a nucleus or uh, a core remanent of this structure. It, to him, the core remanent of this dwarf galaxy was in Canis Major. And in this region. He uh, tried to show us what is supposed, again, using galactic models, uh, or using anybody models, uh, uh, a kind of accretion that was uh, more in a perpendicular orbit with Milky Way, how it should be distributed around the Milky Way, these stars. And in the epoch, it was similar to the details that you have. But um, later, the, the debate is. Uh, was heated in the literature, let's say it like that. We have a lot, several papers uh, that defended the in situ or the in situ origin for these structures, not just for monoceros, but um, for triangular Andromeda and other structures. And uh, the thing started to modify in 2015 uh, with mainly two uh, papers, but I'm going to talk about just about this from Shu. Uh, basically, you see a projection. I know that it's not in galactic coordinates, but um, there is galactic, uh, here is the longitude, here is the latitude. And what they get is data from SDSS uh, in stripes that are equal in the north and the south hemisphere, where they can compare the distributions in the north and the south. So when they start to do that, they select one stripe. And basically, what are seen here, they subtract the north minus the south. Uh, so they just select a specific region in this color magnitude diagram uh, here, for example, in this range of the color, uh, to select may basically more um, turn off stars. And when you see the north uh, in the south, it subtract this. This is the result. You have more stars in the north, after in the south, later in the north, later in the south, and it keeps going. So what they just, uh, said that the galaxy was uh, has some waves some patterns that was kind of wave. So the galaxy was doing real waves. So the first structures here are not discussing here, but we have the uh, monoceros in the south, monoceros in the north, uh, triangular Andromeda in this region. So the galaxy was, was 
uh, their hypothesis about what is going on. We have some simulations, and the simulations um, here from a, a galaxy that was um, uh, evol evol evolved um, in the universe alone, so it was just one galaxy, but you can see the patterns that you can see some um, densities, patterns that was kind of waves in the and some um, basically around all the, the the galaxy. You can see this, basically these patterns overall the galaxy. You can cannot, cannot see just this in any body simulations, but in cosmological simulations too. And more recently, um, Laporte uh, used a, a Milky Way analog and a Sagittarius analog. Um, dwarf galaxy to put these two objects to interact. So when he puts these objects to interact, what he observed that maybe these are not oscillations in the disk, but maybe kind of features in the disk. Uh, when you see these passages from the, 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 the galaxy, from the Sagittarius dwarf galaxy around the Milky Way, it's going to uh, make the disk get heated. And uh, every passage, it's going to make the disk evolve differently and make this start to get heated for, to up to the, the galactic disk. So it doesn't depend on of only on passage, but to several of these passages. So you can see kind of arcs that are formed here. So basically, you see galactic uh, longitude and these kind of patterns in the simulations over the time. So you expect to form it in a specific time, and it's going to evolve, and maybe it's going to be dissolved over the time. So um, what is showing us that maybe these passages that you are seeing right now uh, from the, the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy with Milky Way are forming these kind of structures. Later, Laporte uh, stood, uh, did the first uh, chemical abundance study from um, Monocerus, and he identified that this population using Apogee data, has um, similar uh, chemical abundance from the thin disk that are seen here in this, this uh, region, and the thick disk is in this region. So it's magnesium over iron and uh, iron over hydrogen here. So alpha elements here. So basically you are seeing that all this population are probably connect to the, 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 uh, the population from the thin disk. So um, in I think it was in 2019. Uh, we started our work with um, an undergrad student. was her first semester. That's Lais Borbolato. Uh, or now she's a French um, PhD candidate here uh, at Universidade de São Paulo. And I'm not showing you the, the, um, the cuts, but uh, she identified a, pos a possible uh, kinematical cut to select this population. And uh, I'm not showing you because it's in preparation right now. But here I'm trying to show you. So this is the north hemisphere of the galaxy. Here is the south hemisphere of the galaxy. She, uh, she's selecting data that's above 3 kiloparsec over the galactic plane uh, or under 3 kiloparsec under the galactic plane. So when you see this kind of cut selection, basically the stellar overdense is in this um, patchy region that you're seeing here in red or expect to have this over there. So in the first selection, uh, basically, you can see that is basically the disk, the galaxy evolving, because here is the galactic center, so here is the sun, and the stars that she selected. But uh, when she gets to this cut selection, she can select, basically, the stars from this stellar over density. And we have more uh, figures, but um, I'm not sure you right now, but when she goes to the, uh, this to the, the chemistry of this, because she's trying to study um, and have a more uh, curated um, chemical pattern of this um, structure over several elements. Uh, basically, we are seeing that those structures, even the monosteres in the south hemisphere and the monosteres in the north hemisphere, have the same kind of chemistry, chemical pattern, even though they are more than 3 kiloparsec distance from each other. So basically, um, this is information that um, we are getting right now that maybe they are forming the same region in the galaxy. They are stripped to different uh, distance from the galactic plane, or basically the uh, evolution in this part of the outer disk was not so. Uh, um, how can I say it? Uh, the evolution of in the chemistry is not so fast as respect to the, the interior of the galaxy. Um, 
Later, we have another structure that which you want is Triangle Andromeda. Uh, Triangle Andromeda was discovered in 2004 and by a professor, Rocha Pinto, which is a professor in Universidade Federal of Rio de Janeiro, which was my advisor in the master's in PhD. And basically, in this uh, study of Hayes uh, using Apogee data, you are seeing different uh, distance here, kiloparsec. Uh, it's uh, galactocentric um, regions. So you are select um, rings between 9 to 10, 10 to 11, 11 to 12, 12 to 13, 13 to 14. And basically, what it's showing us is these stars that you are selecting Apogee at this distance in black. These stars from Triangle Andromeda in yellow that we expect to have in the distance of Triangle Andromeda, which is about 20 kiloparsec, uh, and stars from uh, the dwarf galaxy uh, Sagittarius. And you can see the median of these values change over uh, the distance every time it gets more metal poor. So what they are saying to us that um, Triangle Andromeda probably is uh, a structure that belongs to the, the outer disk, but has it's just a trend that we expect uh, get when you go more uh, in the outer disk, as we don't have any sample before from the outer disk. When you look at these uh, structures alone, it looks like that they don't belong to Milky Way, but when you look at the trend, it looks like that uh, these belong to Milky Way. So these structures probably belong to Milky Way, so have an in-situ origin, not a, a greater origin. Bergman has a study too with um, high resolution, uh, and identify too that those stars um, has some chemical pattern that was similar to the, not to the outer disk, but to the uh, thin disk of Milky Way. So we have a different kind of approaches, and later, and Sally Silva um, presented too, uh, and identify something that was interesting. Um, here, there are a lot of plots, but ba um, points here, but basically I want you to focus in our sample that is the red one here, what is expect from Milky Way in this region and the stars that are from open galactic clusters in the outer region. And what he uh, identified here is basically that uh, those stars uh, looks like the, in the sodium has some kind of pattern of elements that are similar to the open clusters in the outer disk. And it's, so it's not so similar to the population from the disk. So it's a kind of unique population, what are you saying uh, uh, in this work? Another thing that uh, they obtained in this work was that uh, to the stars that they get, that some of those stars maybe you can see a pattern that could be a knee. So we have a knee in the alpha elements start to evolve, and later you get this plateau in this region here. So we, we decided to study this. And this was being developed by uh, Yuri Bushain, which is a master's student here, advised by Professor Silvia Rossi, which I'm the co-advisor. And uh, he has some questions to answer us, um, that if was Triangle Andromeda has the cl chemistry of open clusters in the outer disk, is if this knee pattern was real or not, and uh, if there was um, contamination of accreted objects in this region. Because we see a lot of contamination from accreted objects from the guy in cells over all the galaxy. So we have about 31. Um, stars from Triangle Andromeda region observed the high resolution spectroscopic races. And the first uh, thing that um, uh, Bouchain has done was trying to understand the, uh, the dynamic of these objects, trying to study the uh, orbital properties of this uh, population. So basically, you are seeing the centricity, or basic how much circular is the orbit of those stars, or the inclination around in, in, uh, in the inclination of those orbits around the Milky Way. And basically, you can separate two groups. One that has lower centricity, about 0.2, and another population that has really high centricity. It's about 0.8, that for people that don't know, it's similar to the populations of uh, Gai Enceladus, which is a creation that dominated the, the, the galactic halo and the Milky Way. Besides that, so here we expect to have um, the action or the angular momentum, so is star, stars that has some uh, 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 how much uh, the energy, the angular moment of those stars, and the energy, uh, how connected to the Milky Way potential they are. So 
I know the values show us that are negative, but here are more connected, so here less connected to the galactic potential. Basically, those stars occupy the region that usually is more for the outer disk, that was expected, and um, are not so similar, uh, are more similar to the, the disk, and those stars are more similar, or in the regions of uh, the angular momenta that are more similar for the Gaia Enceladus. So the Gaia Enceladus here, you can see basically in this region here. So what is, uh, when you see the vector of projection of this, uh, the velocity projection vector of this, uh, um, stars basically see the, all the blue stars moving to the same direction and the red stars are moving around to different directions. So basically what he, uh, he did find here is that this population problem probably is a contamination in this region. What explain why some people at some point of the, the studies identify this structure as a possible accretion because some stars here has chemistry from a greater objects. So when you go to look to this, uh, now the, uh, the chemical abundance of this structure here in blue points and the red points are that stars that expect to be accreted. And the green are of plot, uh, points from Bergman, the paper that I showed you before, the plot from the plot that I showed you before, and from Hayes here that has data from Apogee. And these are stars that are from Apogee, they are 17, that are far away from 17 kiloparsec from the uh, from us. So we are trying to compare just the outer disk with this population. And basically what is seen here, oh sorry, these yellow contours are the contours from the guy in cells population or, or the, what is the expected abundance from this population, which is a created population. So basically what is seen that this population is basically um, from Triangular Andromeda is connected to the outer disk population, a little more metal poor than the, the because it's more far away. It was what expected, and but there was some connection that to, uh, some stars that has some overlap in several spaces with different abundance. So we have to try to discriminate to make sure that this population or these abundance are not from the guy Enceladus to make sure. So. If you go to the nickel or this element, you can see clearly that there is no overlap or even though in the end of this project, there is no overlap between these blue stars. So basically, uh, the stars that you are selecting in, the, uh, in this distance, in the triangular Andromeda region, belong to the, uh, are in situ population or to belong to uh, the galaxy and not accreted, but to have some contamination from accretion in this region. So this is basically the, the results from you, uh, Abu Shain, and I think that another really nice result that he got was that we speculate, but we have to explore yet, is that probably this structure has just a small, a small spread of metallicity, which indicates that this um, region or population didn't uh, chemical uh, have um, uh, regiment um, before it was read, uh, heated by the passage of another dwarf galaxy. So it started to form in stars and it was heated to uh, a more distant part of the Milky Way before it to get evolved and form new stars in this region. We identify uh, new uh, low latitude stellar over densities uh, using Gaia data, using a new method to use proper motion. Here you can see the, how uh, amazing is this technique to identify, so here is one that arch that I showed you before. This is the anti-center, and here is the region where you can see monoceros in the north hemisphere. So anti-center stream, monoceros over density in this region. And um, so we are getting better to select these objects, as I showed you, and um, as Laís, um, oh, sorry, Borbolet showed you in her, her work. And recently applying it to all the data from the Gaia, we identified several new uh, stellar over densities. So here is this structure here that you are seeing here. Here is monocera in the North Hemisphere. Here the monocera is in the South. Here is Triangle Andromeda. Uh, and there are new stellar structures here, very near to the galactic planes. So we don't know yet how these structures were formed and how they are evolving and when they are formed. So we have a lot of questions yet. So now I'm moving to, I um, just need one second to check the time. Uh, so now I'm moving to the halo, and I'm going to try to discuss some structures that are in the galactic halo. 
So here you're seeing uh, structures that are between 10 to 25 kiloparsec from us. You're removing basically all the galactic plane uh, uh, latitude here, longitude here. So here is the data, are uh, basically our, our Lyra stars. Uh, and you are seeing the project of those stars in the sky uh, from Pan stars, I think so, this data comes from. And here you're comparing it a galactic model, which is like a um, Besançon galactic model or Galaxia, that you can predict the amount of stars that we expect the galaxy have in some specific direction. And when you subtract, you have the residual, and you can see that we can identify some over densities or residual. The, uh, structures in the map. So one of these is the Hercules Aquila overdensed hack, and another one here is the Virgo, Virgo overdensed uh, uh, here in this region. Uh, we have other structures here, but uh, are basically connected to stellar strings uh, or Sagittarius string. And these excess appear for different distance, and like 10 to 25 or more to 10 to 20, uh, 50. 20, we can see the, the excess of this peak here. And this structure are basically in the galactic halo to 10 to 20 kiloparsec. And when you get the uh, Gaia data, we are able finally to not just to see these uh, stellar populations, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, where they are, or to identify this, but to try to start to get some information from this star. So, Simeon uh, tried to identify if there was a common origin between those structures, between Arcturus Acla and Virgo Overdensis. So what they get was uh, our, our little stars from these stellar overdensities and trying to obtain the um, orbital, par it, not try, they obtained uh, the orbital parameters from these stars. So basically you are seeing the max z, which is the, um, what is the maximum distance that a star can get far away from the galactic plane, the centrist of those stars, the apocentric, uh, which is the closest uh, distance of these stars from, the, um, uh, sorry, uh, the maximum distance that they reach, the maximum um, they reach, and the galactic uh, radius that they are basically connect or you can identify. And basically, all those stars, when you see the, 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 the centricity, is they uh, have really high centricity. When you see the uh, Virgo over density and the Hark, basically higher than 0 0.8. And the pericenter is really low, between um, probably next to the galactic plane, between 0 to 5. And the upper center of those stars are, or the maximum distance that you reach, uh, it's between 10 to 20 kiloparts. So basically, what you see is these stars are passing through the galactic plane, they go up to the uh, really far away from the galactic plane. This is the region uh, where they get the maximum distance from the galactic plane, so the, the velocity get lower. So this is because, because of it, you are seeing this amount of stars in this specific region, and later they start to accelerate again and move again. So uh, this is the region where these stars move uh, with less velocity. Here uh, is another figure from the galactic halo. And um, Yori Belokurov, Belokurov show us for different um, distance from the galactic plane, cuts between 0 to 5, minus 5 to minus uh, 10, to 5 to 10, so negative under the galactic plane and above the galactic plane. And what uh, the phi is two over densities between minus 10 to 30, or basically that the halo has some pattern that is not spherical, but it's kind of uh, asymmetrical uh, galactic halo. And what you can explain, what is this Virgo over density and what is this Hercules Acla? Uh, it's a amount of stars that uh, show us that the galactic halo is not symmetric, it basically that are not, uh, the galactic halo is not smooth. But what is the origin of this? So we have some hints that they probably have some kind of similar ori origin, even though they are not connected. So uh, in this period, we have uh, we discovered several new stellar structures in the galactic halo uh, that are over um, uh, from uh, past accretions from Milky Way or ancient accretions like the guy Enceladus or Helm strings from Sequoia that we don't know yet if it's another structure or is connected to the guy Enceladus or Tumnus. Uh, but uh, basically, in this work, Balbino and Helmi, uh, they um, try to they study the orbital parameters, so they integrate the orbital from 
uh, billions of stars. And basically what they try to compare with is which one is the most probable uh, uh, region that these uh, stellar overdenses occupy. So are these regions. If they are more similar to the orbits from Sequoia, from the guy Enceladus, from the Helm strings, or from Terminus. So basically they obtain a kind of um, probability um, section to try to connect these stellar overdenses to the past accretions of Milky Way. So this is what they have done here. And um, they uh, identify that it's more probable that Hercules, Arcula, and Virgo overdenses are connected to the guy Enceladus. So they belong to this past accretion in some way. So we are going to see now how it can be formed. So in 2008, we are trying to understand the structures next or nearby the galactic plane. So here you are seeing the pro what you expect to see uh, uh, accretions, different patterns of accretions, three different uh, that are accretions that are connected to, uh, to a galaxy analog to Milky Way, but uh, has different inclinations when they start to uh, get um, uh, interact with Milky Way. So this is what you expect to see outside of Milky Way, and this is what you expect to see from Earth. So you can see these patterns that are regions that has more uh, stars that we can see that are not patterns that we can connect to any kind of passage of this dwarf galaxy, but basically kind of clouds or structures that don't have any connection, that don't look like any connection to us, but they are connected when you see from outside. And uh, recently, uh, in this paper from Naidu, uh, he has a simulation where he, he put to uh, interact a galaxy analog from Milky Way, a galaxy analog to the what you expect to do the guy Enceladus to be. And you have a different distance. And basically, in this distance between 10 to 20 kiloparsec, uh, what you can see is uh, that this evolution of the interaction of those galaxies we expect to have some uh, over density or part of the stars from uh, this dwarf ga uh, galaxy expect to be between 10 to 20 kiloparsec and in north and south in the north hemisphere, so, which are very similar to what you see before that was Hercules Acla Virgo over density. So this is came from simulation where you put uh, uh, two galaxies to interact. And here we can see that we expect to have another kind of pattern of structure but really far away from us, over 30 to 50 kiloparsec that I didn't explore yet. So we didn't have any kind of uh, connection before just uh, from uh, kinematics or orbital parameters. So we needed to try to understand if there is uh, some chemical composition, chemical abundance that are similar between these structures to try and understand if, if they are really from the same uh, ob object of accretion. So we decided to start uh, the Hercules Acla and Virgo over density uh, with Apogee data and um, Segway data to try and understand if they really have a common origin because if they really have a common origin, we expected the chemistry of these objects because the stars have the memory of the, uh, or, uh, the site of they are formed so we expect the chemistry to be the same from these overdenses if from the guy in Celadus. And um, as I don't have too much time, I'm going to pass this. But basically, this is the overview. So we have the Virgo overdensity data, Hercules Acla in the North Hemisphere, Hercules Acla in the South Hemisphere. We separate it in two regions. And here, the projections in the galactic plane projection. So we have uh, hundreds of stars in SEGU data that is um, uh, a low resolution and a high resolution from Apogee, we have those in stars. And basically, you select a uh, sample that you expect to be similar to the guy in Celadus, uh, selected in two different uh, planes, in angular moment and in, in the action uh, radial plane, too. Basically, doing this sample selection, you are selecting stars that are much more um, poor sample. Uh, uh, um, much more, sorry, much more rich sample that are um, comp uh, that expect to be uh, from the guy in Celadus. It don't have any kind of contamination from any kind of other kind of substructure. And we did this uh, a new selection too, and and the, this uh, chemical uh, abundance uh, plot: magnesium over uh, magnesium and aluminium over iron. 
to select this region where is decorated the stars, so to have this sample from the guy in Celadus. And later we start to compare this sample with our sample. So the guy in Celadus that we select is in yellow, is the Hercules Aqua uh, in orange and uh, pink, and the Virgo Overdance in blue. So basically all those Overdance has the same kind of pattern. You can see the distribution here. And um, as you can see, the centers get higher over 0 0.7, 0 0.8 for these structures. But you can see that uh, there is some kind of middle, um, middle uh, eccentricity structure high here. And this is a structure that calls our attention. And basically, it was uh, segregated by different metallicities. So uh, samples in different metallicities. So here, only stars that has lower metallicity than minus 0.2 and minus 0.1 to minus 0.2. You can see it still have this population, but it's much more, uh, the fraction of stars is much more higher uh, when you have more metal poor stars. But apogees uh, does have too much metal poor stars, so we have this bias to better understand this structure. And when you go to the region that we spec to have the peak of the guy in Celadus, you can see that these uh, structures are very similar to what we spec to have the guy in Celadus, but we still have a tail in eccentricity. And you, when you go to more rich metal uh, stars, we still have some stars from the guy in Celadus, a little uh, small number of stars. It can be explained because the guy, uh, the guy, those stars was uh, ripped from this dwarf galaxy in the halo much early than those stars that are connected in the region high here. They don't have too much time to evolve, so they don't have too much stars. And um, another possible explanation for those stars too is that that these stars in the middle eccentricity don't have too much time to evolve a chemical. Maybe they are not belong to the guy in Celadus. Maybe is another structure. We don't know yet. And um, there is a bias. When you select bias, when you select these stars, here in um, angular momentum, basically, when you compare to the simulations, this is simulation from Amarante. Uh, Amarante has um, a huge um, library of simulations uh, from analog of milk waste with the guy in Celadus, with different angular uh, inclinations and thing. Uh, and it has two um, metallists from those stars. And basically, what you see that the more rich stars are in this region next to the zero. And the more metal poor stars are more in this re region with higher angular momentum. And as we are selecting just stars that are here in this region, we expect to select mo much more rich stars and the stars that have more eccentric orbits. So this is what happened. And but basically, we expect to have at least between minus minus one point. Uh, to, to 10 percent of stars uh, to belong to accreted stars in the region of less eccentric orbits. So this explains why you don't have the, that tail in the, in the guy in Celadus data that you are seeing here in the yellow part. It doesn't mean that uh, guy in Celadus doesn't have this tail, but just because of simple selection, you are removing those stars. Uh, but um, what, is, what I'm showing you basically that the all these stars are very similar in eccentricity to the, the guy in Celadus. And when you go to the chemistry, oh, we compare to other structures too, and you don't identify any kind of structure in the galaxy that has the, this kind of pattern of uh, eccentricity as this middle eccentricity that can reach so far away from the galactic plane. So we don't know any kind of structure yet that can form this kind of uh, structure that you identify there. When you go to the, the uh, chemical composition of those structures, basically here we se uh, separate from the apogee data that has much higher resolution. And the background is uh, the data from the apogee. And basically, uh, we are seeing here the thin disk, thick disk, and the region that's more halo or accreted region. And the guy in Celadus contours here in yellow. And the sample from uh, HAC in, in orange and pink, and the uh, Virgo overdensed in blue. Uh, we remove those stars that are far from this region, that they expect to be the region, or, or they expect to have the accreted stars. And we remove stars that has uh, eccentric, eccentricity lower than 0 0.7, that is these empty symbols here. But when you compare the bulge of those stars, that is just a small fraction of our sample, uh, that is more than 88% uh, of our sample, uh, we can see that in over all the element uh, spaces, 
like here in magnesium of iron, iron of hydrogen, aluminum uh, against iron, or uh, nickel over iron, and the explosive elements from carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. Of all these regions, all these figures are connected to the guy in Celadus population. So basically, what you're showing here is that Hercules Aquila and Virgo Verdensity are not just um, similar in the dynamical properties, but they have, have the same chemistry of the, uh, the guy in Celadus. So they have the same, it's really plausible that they have the same origin. Uh, but yet, um, here I show another figures, but I can go uh, under to finish it. And we have other st structures more distant than these to 14 to 20, that was these pieces over densities right here. And uh, it was the next uh, thing that was expected to study, but some people get in front of us. And they compare some st uh, stars from these structures that you can see that I show you the simulation from I do 2000 that there was kind of pattern of string. They studied these structures, uh, the chemical uh, chemical abundance for the structure, and it is very similar from the for the guy in Celadus population. So basically, what is saying that all these structures, all these over densities that you have in the uh, in galactic halo, came from this one only accretion, or looks like like that, or at least. Um, the majority of this, but some of them could have some contamination. So to finish it, uh, the conclusion, the chemical properties of uh, the low latitude stellar over the chemical properties are similar to the uh, thin disk uh, of the Milky Way or, or the more the outer disk, as you saw for the monoceros for Triangle Andromeda e over uh, to all those structures. Um, so this deb debate uh, is closed. The structure are in situ, but have some contamination, but the contamination is really small. Now we have another open question is when they are formed, uh, because we needed to try and understand when the passage of those dwarf galaxies could be have hit the disk to try to form these structures. And with this, we can have some uh, fingerprints uh, in age and when this galaxy was created to try to better understand the evolution of these galaxies. And in the halo stellar over densities too, uh, we know that basically all those uh, stellar structures has uh, uh, chemistry that are more similar to the guy in Celadus population. I'm not saying that all the, those are from the, the guy in Celadus, but the majority of part of the, gal uh, the galactic halo came from the guy in Celadus. It came, there, is, uh, there are other studies that use simulations to, to show us and studies that has that have uh, some data that are from uh, observations that show us that the majority part of the galactic halo has uh, starts from this population. And we have a lot of open questions here too that came from how those structures um, were formed and in which moment and how they are still alive in the galactic halo because it was expected to have happened 10 giga years ago. So how the Galat Halo uh, didn't uh, make this population get uh, especially uh, diffuse. We expect not to see any more of this because you are expected to get completely diffuse when you're looking in the models and, and simulations. And how this survived so long uh, in the Galat Halo. And when they are formed, and um, are these um, overdenses has are from the outer part of this dwarf galaxy, are these over densities uh, uh, ripped before or later than what you expect to see in the, in the next to us in the region because all this population is mixed with the, the galaxy population. So we have a lot of open questions about uh, the guy cells, it is over densities, about when they are formed, uh, uh, how they evolve, um, and if all those structures belong to only one simple accretion or more than one accretion. And we don't have any kind of uh, reason to believe that we have just one uh, accretion in the galaxy because we know from the simulations, uh, even the cosmological simulations, they expect to have a lot of accretions during the first giga years of the galaxy. So this is uh, the end. I hope you better understand what is uh, stellar over densities, the discussion over the time, and uh, what you have right now in this field. Thank you.
Thank you very much for the, thank you, Richard, for the very interesting talk. And for me, it's really uh, impressive the level of details we are doing. Uh, you guys are unveiling uh, our galaxy and uh, unveiling the, the history of formation. It's uh, something very new, in the, some level of details that only the, in the last decade, it seems it was possible, right? Is it so? Yes, uh, it was, I think, it was in the f last five years. Last five. I think it, uh, even though if you get my thesis, you're going to yeah. see that my thesis don't have anything from this because they don't have Gaia. So when you get this um, uh, uh, precision in distance, um, all these orbital parameters that you can have some from the radial velocities with proper motions, and when you start to have more um, these um, uh, high resolution spectroscopy surveys with much more stars than we have in the past. And I think that was a lot of things that are evolving to get uh, in the same time, uh, have all this information. And this is a really amazing moment to be working in this area. A lot of work, a lot of papers, but it's a really uh, nice moment to be working in this field because you are seeing everything changing just five years. Because we didn't know in five, uh, five years ago, if you ask me, uh, if we expect to have a big creation that we can see all those stars uh, around, milk, uh, around the, even though this, the solar neighborhood uh, that can form all these over density can uh, change, form the, the, the thick disk and things like that, I was not say I don't see any evidence about this. So we, uh, all this came in the last five years, basically. We have some hints. I'm not saying that you don't have before. But the really uh, uh, heavy inf uh, information or the, 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 the uh, sorry, I forgot the word, but uh, these, I uh, forgot the word, but all these, uh, the, the results that it show have get us to this uh, uh, hypothesis and confirmation came from the last five years. Thank you for sharing all this. They are, they are really useful. There are a uh, few groups that are working really heavy in this. Uh, uh, we know um, a Brazilian colleague, that is João Amaranti, that uh, works with this uh, kind of approach to give us a lot of uh, uh, anybody with um, um, hydrodynamical, because it gives us uh, still metallicity information to try better understand what you see in the data because basically we don't have too much data but with these simulations we start to get, have a better view of what is more uh, um, probable to happen to, uh, the, with this interaction and what you see than uh, to have some um, any hypotheses that are, are not very uh, real. So the simulations that you are getting right now are very important and give us a lot of uh, information about what is seeing the data. And it came together with the, all this data, too. Right. I have one question, but uh, I'm not going to cut the line. I don't know if it was fired. Yes. That's <laughs> It was in the epoch that was Milky Way. I don't remember the, it was the 10 and 9 and Milky Way, but it has expected to have 1 to 4, 1 to 10 of the mass of Milky Way in the epoch of accretion. So it was the, the, the mass that we expect to have to this kind of 10 and 9 problem. So it's a minor, a minor merger? I don't, I don't, I, I, 1 to 4 is not a minor merger, but it's between 1 to 4, 1 to 10. We don't know yet exactly uh, the mass, but it's back to be in this range of values. I don't know. I don't think 1 to 4 to be a really small merger, uh, but I know that it's not enough to, to cut the star formation in the Milky Way, and it was a really young star. Uh, galaxy has a lot of gas that was created for Milky Way, too. 
uh, when was the last major merge uh, with Milky Way? Do you know? No, this one is expected to be the, the last, um, how can I say, um, big ma um, as major merger from Milky Way. This is expected to be the last. That happened 10 giga years ago. Yes. And uh, that's interesting because uh, I, I saw some simulations when when you have uh, a merger in this mass range, in this, uh, this ratio, you produce uh, some uh, a kind of wave in the stellar population. You see like shells in the galaxy. In fact, it was uh, an elliptical galaxy, but I think it could do things like that on a, on the disk on a spiral uh, galaxy. And it reminded me of your one of your slides that you showed the the waves, possible waves on the disk of the Milky Way. But uh, the question I have is a little bit different. It's uh, about uh, cosmological simulations. When you simulate a structure that's more or less like the local group, you see lots, lots of uh, uh, dark matter halos. Not all these halos would be galaxies. The smaller one probably cannot form stars, cannot hold the, the, the gas. And I was thinking if uh, some of these overdensities in the halo, perhaps also in the low latitude stellar overdensities, could be produced by the passage of these dark halos through the, the galaxy. It's, uh, could this be a possibility? Could this, this be tested with these okay. observations? OK, you have a kind of structures that you call wake. Um, that uh, wake of the halo that was uh, expected to have during the passage of the uh, large Magellan cloud and small Magellan cloud. There is one kind of overdense that you are trying to understand if it's real or not yet, because it's really far away. And uh, what is expected that the passage uh, of the, the uh, large Magellan cloud has shifted the, the, the dark matter distribution of the galactic halo, so we can see kind of group of stars forming or forming a stellar overdensity. But this is from the passage of uh, two huge uh, uh, dwarf galaxies in the galactic halo. It's different from like um, what you expect or you saying when you see these. Um, uh, Small dark clumps uh, are expected to don't have gas for some reason, and we expect to have just these small uh, uh, dark matter halos that we don't have expect to have any star. That was the problem of the missing satellite problem that you have in 20 years, 15, 10 years ago. And um, basically, I don't expect these small um, halos could form these kind of structures that are really elongated you know, over and thousands of degrees. For example, um, um, Virgo is more than 2,000 degrees in the sky. So it should be have uh, like a really huge amount of uh, mass to form this kind of pattern or interaction to uh, uh, aggregate the, those stars. So it's more uh, feasible to have uh, creation in the past. And these stars are spores or shells that was hit for those par part. I don't know if I, I don't have here. But um, I was expected to have more shells uh, in these regions. I don't have this figure here, but when you see um, the interaction, you have to have um, form what they call shells uh, that are cascas. No? Okay, so shells in the galactic halo, and uh, but was not expected to survive so long. But maybe the problem today survive so long is the distribution of the dark matter and the galactic halo is not be smoothed or not to be, um, uh, how can I say, symmetrical, can be triaxial, like we see, even though the stellar halo is, when you look at the uh, Hercules Aquila in the Virgo over density, to be in that shape that are uh, not symmetrical. Some of them can be uh, linked to some of the 
events of appropriation rights. So you, you have the, the knowledge of, uh, you can reconstruct a little bit some uh, of these events. Uh, m my question is, uh, I, I know it's impossible uh, to, to take statistics of these events to, uh, to, to, to say something about uh, uh, the scenario of growing of a galaxy by this Accretion events, uh, but uh, it's in the same line as the question of just uh, the number of these events and the mass that uh, were accreted by these events is consistent with what we expect from cosmological scenario, what we see in simulations. It's not possible to draw conclusions from the data, from the data. Okay, uh, now from this part of the literature, uh, I'm not too aware. Like and the number uh, of expected, probably there is some study that uh, has um, get some um, uh, analog Milky Way analogs to try and understand uh, if we expect to have how much uh, major events or similar events. Usually the people are looking for events that are similar, but I don't know about the number, so uh, I don't have this information for you right now. Uh, so I can uh, try to look for it and give you later this information, but. I don't know yet. Uh, I think that uh, as we see, not just only in Milky Way, even though in the local group of like uh, um, 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 for Andromeda, we don't expect to have like a really major events like in galaxy analog that are similar in some way that are, are spiral galaxies. But um, I don't know the information about uh, the number of events. I know, for example, the number of satellites are similar that was the, uh, what, what we expected in the simulations. But I don't know about these event, events of accretion. And I think that you are not in the same order yet in the, in the uh, simulological cosmology and the number of satellites. But because uh, we don't have any uh, really deep photometric survey that goes over all the sky, now we're going to have the LSST that is going to cover a really huge area that is going to be really deep, so going to increase a lot of the number of Milky Way satellites, I think, in the next uh, few years. So probably going to go at least to the same order and what is what is expecting. But about the uh, accretions or the past accretions, I don't have this information. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello. Let's see if, if you, someone has more questions. So the last question. Uh, which are the most uh, important elements to characterize this uh, pattern? Okay, so I think that uh, we have some spaces that are um, more easy to segregate the dwarf galaxies from the Milky Way population, but usually it's useful to use more than one space because on just only one, it's not to be um, good enough. Basically, because there is some overlap in some regions. For example, when you use just magnesium of iron, iron of uh, hydrogen, there is some overlap of these populations at some times with uh, the uh, more outer disk populations of Milky Way, or at some point, uh, the thick disk or the heated thick disk of Milky Way in some part. So um, it's not easier to use just one in space. Uh, but as you can see here, like other spaces, like when you have uh, uh, magnesium over magnet, sorry. Oh, I think I used it wrong. I know, I correct one. But you're, when you use this space, you can segregate very well. But in this region, you start to get some overlap with other populations from uh, local or uh, smaller dwarf galaxies, like for example, LMC, SMC, here in this region, uh, more is dominated by this kind of population to 10 to 6 um, solar masses, uh, dwarf galaxies. And here, uh, there is some overlap between these populations too. And But we can use several different spaces to try to get a more decontaminated population, but it's not possible to say that we cannot have a for example, one star that don't have an element that are similar to Milky Way at some point. So basically, it's um, so if you use only chemistry and if you use only dynamics, um, sometimes it will not, not give you the answer. 
because we have uh, another paper that you published in uh, um, 2021 that was studying um, host, uh, host, uh, host is a planet stars. And you are trying to identify from these stars if any of those stars came from uh, accretion. So trying to identify the first uh, ex extragalactic exoplanet inside of Milky Way. So you are trying to do that. It was a really nice idea. And when you studied the, the, uh, the Orbital, uh, the orbital properties of this uh, specific star, that uh, one of these exoplanet stars, um, it has uh, all the orbital properties that was similar to the guy in Celadus. So you are really excited, really, really excited. But when you went to the chemistry, uh, the chemistry was in the middle of all this region. The chemistry was here. Again, I oh, know. It was really here and was not convinced that it was a created star because the elements are much more similar to a population that was uh, in situ population than uh, um, a, a created population. So in the end, it was basically not the first one, but it was open uh, a field to the people to trying to identify those kind of stars with exoplanets. We don't know yet if it's possible, because basically all those exoplanet stars has a higher metallicities, so it's not easy to uh, form planets in uh, metal poor stars, or even though with less than minus one. but. It was something. So what I'm trying to say is that sometimes when you have only one information, it's not enough. If you can have some star that is here, in this region here, for example, that you say that is probably belonging to the guy in Celadus, but uh, uh, the, the, the dynamical is from the thick disk. Dynamics is from the thick disk. So it's more feasible to be some population from the Milky Way than from the disk. Sometimes when you are looking just for one only star, it's not easy to identify if this object belong or not. But when you are looking statistically or looking to the overall, we can try to draw the, the, the regions that are dominated by one population or another to try to understand if it's more feasible to belong to one population or another. It, this is because of it that um, chemical uh, uh, dynamical analysis are really important in our area right now. Okay, so let's thank again Elio. Thank you, Elio. Thank you. I would like to say that tomorrow Elio is going to give another talk. Uh, he's going also to talk about uh, his area of research, but with another language, uh, more focused on... In Portuguese? Uh, in Portuguese to undergrad students and also the general public. So uh, if you're interested, tomorrow midday here at this auditorium, it will be also uh, broadcast via YouTube. Uh, and I invite everyone now to come to a coffee break by the side of the auditorium, and you also, also can uh, talk more with Elio during this coffee break, during questions, and uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone, uh, everyone following uh, via YouTube, uh, Google Meet, and that's it. Thank you, Elio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.